Uh, I had a hobby too. Mine happened to be guns and ballistics. And I studied guns and ballistics as much as I could and I wrote an article it was about high velocity. So out of all my years working at Weatherby, the last five have been some of the most exciting. Working with Adam, with him running the company. And to think that I get the opportunity of carrying on my grandfather's legacy 75 years later here in Sheridan, Wyoming, I mean, it really is a dream come true. On Our Mark, the Weatherby Podcast. Welcome back to On Our Mark, the <laughs> Weatherby Podcast. We got uh, Rob Gearing, Handsome Rob, handsome. in the building. I don't know who called me Handsome Rob, yeah, but I'll take it. Yeah, that's a cool it. nickname, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as always, we've got Tyler, our marketing manager. Howdy. Rob. You've you've been you've been on the podcast no, at least once. No, 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 never been on never? Weatherby before. So it's a bit of a privilege, and I would like to say, just to start things off, what a wonderful job you guys have done here. I mean, I met I met Adam Weatherby in California when they were still in California. Yep. And um, what you've managed to pull off in a very short space of time between Adam and the crew is pretty pretty impressive. This is a a pretty um, it's an amazing facility. There's a new energy and a new vigor in this company. Yeah. And you're yeah. really pushing some buttons. And, uh, well, we'll talk about the rifle later that I used in Mongolia, but I grew up knowing about Weatherby, so it feels like a bit of a privilege to finally be here. Sure. Um, and, and you grew up, you have an accent, but let's uh, just for those that maybe don't know, you grew up where? I didn't grow up in Australia. <laughs> I did spend a lot of time in New Zealand and a lot of people say, you're lousy. Um, but, no, Britain, yeah. which is not, um, what I would say, a hunting-friendly country anymore. Yeah. I'm com- when I say that, I say it with a... It's compared to the USA. You know, there's no public land. There are people getting out there now and pushing buttons because I keep saying, we've got to get more people into hunting, guys. We've got yeah. to do this. We've got to make people aware that this is a good thing to do. And we've been doing it for a few thousand years, haven't we? Yeah, probably longer than we have. Yeah, yeah. So you why don't count Native American? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so why um why has it so become so alien and and yeah we're tr- we're probably twenty years down the line from you guys where people I used to grow up shooting rabbits and sure. I'd give them to my neighbours. If I did that now, I'd probably get arrested. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah anyway. they think you're crazy. Yeah. So if if people don't know, you've got a pretty cool company and it's two way street. You you've come a long way. I think since I probably met you five or six years yeah. ago, since um, uh, with with at the time I think you had your bipod it, originally, right? That that was it. My the the business at Spartan is probably eleven years old now. Started okay. it at tender age of fifty, maybe a little bit, yeah. And I'm heading that way, heading to sixty. So let's say ten years old, but really properly going the last five years yeah and yes you're absolutely right it starts it started with a mountain hunting bipod it's a very specialist little tool it um is. the javelin yeah. is basically for people like me you know when i'm climbing my background's climbing mountains so i wanted a really lightweight functional little tool that i can put on the rifle when i need it does the job and it does it very well for that environment and yeah. take it off when i don't it's not a competitor with l- plenty of other good bipods out there. So it's, it's I a always, specialized tool. It's for a speci- sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, the, it's the Kenyan long distance runner. <laughs> now, <laughs> if you want the ultimate shot putter, that's not your tool. You know, you have to pick a different right. stable or a different right. horse. Um, and as of 2024, Spartan will be offering more horses in there. I got you. Gotcha. So, so there will be. Four, arguably five bipods as of 2024. Okay. So all modular, they all share the same. They can all unscrew and you can share legs yep. and do things, but you'll have your long distance runner. You'll also, at the other end of the stable, have your 338 50 cow bipod. Okay. So wow, we've cool. been doing that with the defense industry. So I thought, well, let's press some buttons. But we haven't managed to achieve what you guys have achieved in such a short pace of time and when I come here you know Spartan's still a little, tiny little business it's growing um, and it's exciting but uh, I come here and think we should be doing better <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah well congratulations well, to Adam and the team yeah. for what you've done yeah we've had a lot of fun the last six six years almost yeah I mean, yeah that's kind of 
That's scary. That's kind of crazy. That is yeah. wild yeah. to say. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, not quite six, but I've almost been with Weatherby six years yeah. coming up on. It's wild. That's crazy. So. I've only been here for a year, but, like, when it first came out, like, it was, like, to me, it was a destination to want to go yeah. to Sheridan here. Yeah. So it's kind of cool how it's built. Big credit to Adam. I mean, yeah. he he's enabled our team to really push forward and do some things that uh, since our move to Wyoming probably would not have been possible in California. I, I would almost say certainly not yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, and I'd say that's that took some intelligence, but ultimately it took a lot of bravery. Almost yeah. frontiersman-like. Yeah. You know, you're stepping yeah. back and you're going back and going. And <sighs> that's that's amazing. Um, and Weatherby isn't a rifle maker to me. It's almost an institution because it's one of the few brands as a child not grown up in a hunting family, everybody knew the Weatherby name. Now, yeah. we could thank maybe John Wayne for those kind of things or whatever, but it's, 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 it's an institution, and it's fantastic that Adam and the team have managed to bring it back to its, you, you know, you're pressing buttons, as I said previously. Yeah. It's incredible. It's, it's fun to challenge the status quo. And, um, yeah, there, I think uh, just like you have done with your bipods, we've really gone after the lightweight market. We found a, a niche there that, like you said, it's a tool. It's not for everybody, uh, like our Mark V backcountry we're going to talk about in a little bit. It's a lightweight rifle meant for mountain hunting. If you want to take it to the range and expect it to do what a 12-pound range gun will do, you'll probably be disappointed, but you'll be less disappointed than if you brought a 12-pound gun on a uh, 12, Yeah, hunt. like 12,000 <laughs> feet. <laughs> at 12,000 12, 12, feet, guys, I, I mean, coming from a climbing background, I do not want a 12-pound gun. I absolutely do not want it. And I'm prepared <laughs> I'm prepared to make those necessary sacrifices or compromises, it's not sacrifices, with a lightweight rifle and a lightweight system, lightweight system approach because I don't want to be carrying anything anything more than I absolutely yeah, need. Yeah, like day day seven or eight when you yeah. got a twelve pound it's my maybe not too bad day one, but day seven or eight you're yeah. like, Man, I've got this on yeah. my slant, all that stuff. I've so. been running the the Spartan bipod for five years uh, i actually took it to kyrgyzstan yeah. with me and shot an ibex in kyrgyzstan using your bipod because i don't think there's a better lighter weight bipod out there it's yeah awesome. if, you, if you walk around the office there's a lot of the the the, the mounts the mounts yeah. so yeah. there's a lot of rifles on the office next yeah. to us that's got the mounts already yeah on, no that's so. cool we're definitely getting there it feels like it's spreading a bit like a bacteria but hopefully <laughs> in a good way no it's good stuff so yeah. um I wasn't there. I talked about it with Adam. I haven't talked about it with you. You had the pleasure of joining, well, I think you organized the trip. So Adam joined you on a hunt last year in Africa with JVB. It wasn't, I can't take the credit for that. It was that JVB? Was, it was JVB. Okay. But, and the thing is, I, JVB for me is a walking encyclopedia, right? Yeah. So if he says, Rob, I've got this trip coming up or blah, 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 I'm, I'm in, right? Because he's done his <laughs> homework. He's... He's right. an old man in a, well, he says he is quite old, but he's not old compared to me, but he's like an old man in a young man's body. That's what I put. Fantastic. And we had the chemistry on that trip was just wonderful. Yeah. You know, I, we had an opportunity. Uh, Namibia is a great place. I'd encourage anybody to get out there and because uh, it's proper hunting. You know, South Africa's got its place, and I love that too, but South Africa's very much more Right, I'm going to shoot this or shoot that. Namibia, I'm as you you all start off as murderers, I think, as young people. You want to kill things, right? right? And it takes <laughs> it takes a few years. Now I'm a, what I would call a hunter, and I absolutely don't care whether it's me pulling the trigger or somebody else. I just love that experience, and whether it's fly fishing or rifles or ice climbing or whatever, they're just the tools, the excuse to get into these wonderful places. So Joseph von Benedict said, we're going to Namibia, boys, and we went to Namibia. And my one takeaway from that was how raw and real it was. You know, we were following buffalo, and there were fresh lion spore on top of the buffalo. We got into a herd of elephant with really tiny babies. That was far more concerning. So when you've got tiny little elephant spore yeah, like that, they right. go, we're when, out of here, That's boys. when mamas get yeah. 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 any time, yeah. bears. Yeah. 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 So so it was that was that was really exciting. But the, the one takeout was uh, Adam, Joseph, and I witnessed this kudu fight, and it was an epic, epic, yeah. gladi gladiatorial battle where one kudu smashed a horn off 
Right? Wow. And the other, there was blood everywhere, and you thought, Phew, that's pretty heavyweight stuff. Um, anyway, the kudu with the smashed horn hung around for a while, and then we lost sight of the other one. And then some time later, maybe, maybe an hour or so, I picked up one 700 yards out, maybe a bit further than that. I said, there's a kudu coming down. It's coming down. It's probably going to come down and drink. And we had your rifle system right. on the Spartan, a, a Spartan tripod with a cradle system at the back. So it was almost like a Adam told me about mobile that. shooting yeah. bench. Yeah. And I wouldn't naturally choose that as a hunting tool. But when you're in a high ground like that where you can actually plan things, why not set it up? And it was Adam's shot. Actually, it was Adam's choice. To, it, was his, it was him behind the trigger. And this, I haven't forgotten this. So this kudu appeared. I was on the other side of the hill at the time. And Joseph came running over and said, Adam wants you to, would you like to do this? And I said, well, you don't have to ask me twice. <laughs> I'm ready. So, so I got behind the Weatherby rifle, loophole optics, Spartan system. Yep. I've got Adam Weatherby sitting next to me. Right, and Joseph von Benedict sitting on the other side doing the turret stuff because I'm not really techie. People always say, I'm a hunter. So I, if I've got somebody like a Joseph von Benedict, you well, know, next to me. Why not use him? Yeah, use him because he's going <laughs> to yeah. do it better than me. And um, yeah. anyway, this kudu appeared fleetingly, and I think it was about, I th- I'm going to say 570 yards seems to ring a bell. Uh, I think so. I've, yeah. That's what Adam yeah, in was, that neighborhood. It was yeah. certainly but not a gimme. No, no, it was certainly <laughs> way out there, and I wasn't going to have a big opportunity on it because it was really forested. So I said, "Joseph, feed the data in. Help me hit." Du-du-du. He said, "You nail that. You're on it." And literally one shot. Doof, I put another one into it, but they were both killer shots, and it was a, just one of those epic right. experiences. Like that, that just happened. Yeah, it just happened. <laughs> yeah. That was a, was that a 330 at RPM? Yeah, was a short barrel yes. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, twenty um, inch barrel. But an inch. amazing tool. Uh, yeah. I mean, the stock design doesn't feel like shooting anything punchy with that stock design and such. No. Like it really, really worked wonderfully well. And then when we got, when we found the kudu, we found like twenty inch bit of horn, which I've got at home in my workshop. Oh, that no was, kidding! Uh, that wasn't stuck in it at the time, but clearly had been stuck in it. So that was the kudu that had been fighting the other one. Oh, it was stuck in the hide. It was stuck in the, it, I think it had gone in the front. Oh, my God. And it was wow. walking around like nothing. I mean, if somebody stuck a horn in me like that, I wouldn't be walking around too <laughs> there, well. There's this Instagram account called Nature is Metal. And it's like, that, 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 that reminds me of that, where it's oh, like, and terrible. for, for that, that's horn too. Yeah. So you think of that other kudu. Yeah. His horns broke for life now. So yep. it's like he, now he's, he's probably at a back. disadvantage. Yeah. So, but that was crazy. one incredible experience and i mean all full kudos to weatherby because that rifle absolutely i might have been behind the trigger but that's definitely a partnership of great events there and great product design you're just not going to pull a shot off like that without an accurate rifle so whatever you lads are doing (laughs) keep up the good work right on right on well thanks for the plug um you you emailed us a couple weeks ago like hey i'm going to be in sheridan want to tell you about this hunt i did and Mongolia. So, spoke to you. Yeah, tonight. yeah. I think we spoke at Portland, uh, uh, Portland and then and Adam yeah. moved us in on an yeah. email, and yeah. So I like uh, my big thing is hunting in the mountains. I mean, I do hunting all over the place, but uh, mountains just tick the boxes for me. So right. ibex are really up there. I, if somebody says, "Rob, do you want to come and shoot an ibex?" Sort of, if I've got the time, count me in. <laughs> right, right. So um, basically, this opportunity appeared. A uh, good friend of mine, Paul Goki, Happy Antelope, he basically said, we're going to go to Mongolia. And I sort of said, not without me, you're not. <laughs> so I sort of invited myself, really. I, I've yeah. done that. That's, that's very effective, by the yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, it works. <laughs> and a really good bunch of guys, really good bunch of guys. And I said, well, hang on a minute. You know, we should, Nick, that we were talking about that sent these pictures in, very good film guy, young, aspirational, but really, really pushing some buttons and, and basically making some great little films. I said, let's make a Mongolian film. So hang on a minute, what rifle are we going to do? And I, so I said to Adam, you've got that great mountain rifle. Can I take one of those? And then we partnered up with Swarovski, Stone Glacier, FHF, Crispy Boots, all good, com- you know, sure. good companies that I believe in, yep. right? And stuff that I would choose to use rather than be 
paid to use, if that makes sense. Yep. So this was, was no financial incentives here. Just said, let's make this work. Let's pick some great brands. Let's make a film. And the, the details for Nick were, I don't want to see an airport in this film because everybody makes film about people yeah, walking. the, the travel let's montage. Let's get 20, 25 minutes of adventure. And actually, nice. the hunting part is almost a byproduct. It's, so, it, it's about eating the food and about being in Mongolia and doing yeah. all And if you've been to Kyrgyzstan, and it, 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 they're such epic places. And Mongolia was a new one for me. I want to ride a motorbike across Mongolia. I thought I was going to do that. I'm going to invite myself. Let's yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mongolia. Speaking yes. my language. Right. Yeah. I, I'm That's down cool. in Patagonia in March actually riding motorbikes. So oh, those we'll, kind of... We'll come back to that. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Luke just perked up there. <laughs> it's, it's literally, if it's fly rods, motorbikes... Yeah, I've forgotten the motorbike bit earlier, but that, you could throw that into the caveat as well. But anyway, so Adam said, let's do this. Then you found me the rifle. We got unknown munitions to put some mounts on it, get it all zero, did all the hard work. Yep. Um, and we went off fully prepared. The problem with Mongolia is you only get 30 rounds. You only can take no. 30 rounds to the country, so make oh. sure people... Yeah. If you're taking a rifle... That's already dialed. You, it's already dialed. And more importantly, it's dialed for the kind of... Or you know what you've got to do at 12,000 feet. Because yeah. I don't think of Mongolia high, but it actually is. You know, I always think of the steps. It's but very high. actually, it's very, very high. Yes. And when you're up at those kind of altitudes, things are going to behave in a different way. And invariably, it's going to be a long-distance shot. So do your homework. Yeah, and so you had the Swaro uh, ELs, the range. I rating? had the ELs. We had the yeah. little Swaro spotting scope. I had those NL Pures, which are just yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, no, we were fully tooled up with Swaro, with Weatherby, and it, everybody was uh, dressed up in stone glassy and those great yeah. crispy. I mean, I love those crispy boots. I've been a big Mindel fan all my life, um, but I've got into crispies. You're not going to get me out on them anymore. You'd have which to uh, which is that? Uh, what pair do you? Rock? They're um, are they called like a bra bra uh, the Brexton or something? Yeah, something like that. Something yeah. Like that. Yeah. But yeah. they are just fantastic, comfy. Yeah. super comfy. I picked them up in Portland when I was with oh, you. Yeah, yeah. When we were at the booth was yeah. right down the. And they were uh, when, good, good company. When I went to Kyrgyzstan, I was I was most nervous because I I never hunted at that altitude before. Yeah. Um, and we were we were told to be ready from twelve to sixteen thousand feet. Yeah. Like I can't even like <laughs> you can't test that in the yeah, U.S. No. But I can do distance, I can do wind. Yeah. But I've never had to compensate that much for altitude, and that's where trusting your equipment really comes into play. I was running the Leicas, but having uh, binos that will range and do your atmospherics in there huge. I got I got there and took a poke at seven hundred something yards, just trying to figure out if I'm really going to trust the yeah. trust what the binos are telling me to do, and. I mean, if I was aiming for a quarter, I hit a quarter <laughs> at 700 something yards. I'm like, okay, I, I can trust it. This yeah. is uh, this feels really good. It was really confidence boosting to have to take like one one shot to to verify. And some other people were not as prepared, and they're going through 10, 15 rounds adjusting stuff. Y yeah, you don't yeah. want to adjust. You once can't you're there. afford no, it. That's not fun. Yeah. No, no, not at all. <laughs> and I'm a wee bit older than you, lads, but I grew up in a sort of environment, certainly in the UK, where it's sort of a semi-professional hunting sort of thing there, because there's far few people with firearms, so you tend to be shooting a lot or managing. Yeah. is probably mm -hmm. yeah. the better analogy. Um, managing a lot of deer. And it was considered unethical to shoot anything beyond, beyond 100 yards. Well, I made the stupid error. The, the guy that got me into hunting, I said, oh, we're getting quite good at this, Jim. You know, when we started <laughs> right. pushing out to 300, he said, no, we're not gearing. He said the gears got better. And he was absolutely yeah. right. The technology now that's available to you, um, if you – I'm not a techie person. I mean, my technology finishes scope, doof, right, that's – corrected 570 <laughs> meters yeah. Duh, yeah. Duh, 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 job done right anything beyond that and i'm phoning joseph <laughs> you know or somebody yeah, like that sure. to say help me out here because it's sure. just not i don't have that mind that copes with that kind of thing i think i have a very simple functional mind where i look at things and say how do i make that lightweight stronger better and actually provide all those simplistic things but when it starts getting beyond sort of Fifth grade maths, I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I have, I, have, I have reason to doubt that, but I, I, I understand what you're saying. Mm. So, so you invited yourself on this hunt to Mongolia. I did. Looking for Ibex. Yeah. 
And uh, so what, what month is it that you're, the trip is? When so you when did we go? We were uh, two months ago. I think, yeah. yeah was it so August, September? Uh, August, September. What are we now? We're, <laughs> we're almost it's November. Halloween. It's, it's Halloween. Halloween. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, like like I was there two months ago, less okay. than two months, probably. Six. That's a terrible thing to yeah. say, is it? <laughs> I don't know. This year, I started in the Arctic, right? Frost damaged to my fingers. I Whoa. thought I permanently damaged my right eye, my shooting eye, because we got frozen, um, and it was all self-inflicted. Then I've been, I just haven't stopped. I ended up going to Bolivia. So I'm terrible with dates, forgive me. But yeah, <laughs> I was there like say six weeks ago. Yeah. We got, that's a rewind. Uh, to <laughs> You got frostbite? Yeah, on these, I've done it a few times in my life. And, but once you've damaged them. It, it's like even more yeah. sensitive, They're right? They're super sensitive. Oh. And what happened was we were, um, I was with a very good friend of mine, Orf Linthroth, who's a bit like a Joseph von Benedict, but Swedish side. And we were Cape Cayley hunting. Um, and that, I don't know if for your, for your listeners, a Cape Cayley is like the biggest, I believe it's the biggest in the grouse family. They huge birds. Um, they get like turkey size. Like a turkey <laughs> size grouse. Yeah, That's yeah awesome. no, it's crazy. I mean, you could get, I'm thinking six, 12, 12, 12, 12 15 pounds, maybe 12 pounds. But it's a big, huge. big bird. And you hunt them using a rifle so you're not using a shotgun on these things and w- moreover which is a bit crazy you're shooting them out of trees with a solid bullet and you think well this is not very <laughs> safe but there's nobody up there right no right way. so you use a barking bird dog or finish spits they call it and okay. if it's a good dog you don't see that dog that dog's working it's in front of thing. you all the time and then suddenly it's got a particular bark when it finds the birds yeah like a treed cat yeah yeah and the birds are bothered by it enough to fly into the tree, but not bothered enough to actually scarp her off. And so the, the hunt is on then. And these birds have got incredible eyesight. And if, you, if they see a human, they're off. No and capercaillie, it's a great word, I love that word. It's a Gallic word, I believe, and it means horse of the woods. Because as they take off, they sound like a horse I was going to ask running. about the sound. <laughs> of a small grouse, yeah. when you're elk hunting, you're in the elk woods. And you're and, surprised. Yeah. And you're not. You're thinking there's going to be elk over here, and there's that <laughs> yeah. right yeah. at your yeah. feet. Will you imagine that on steroids? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's It ex- sounds like a horse. Oh, it's, it's crazy. So, well, needless to say, it got so cold uh, at the beginning of this year, we didn't see a caper, Kaylee. And I've done enough with, uh, with all before to see them and shoot them and it's an epic trip but i actually felt like an old man this time because i had a hernia that i hadn't had i'd been putting off for a long like putting off for like 15 years actually (laughs) and we um we're skiing on skis that are very thin but they're 11 foot long and you're just bound at the front because the snow is very soft okay so you have to walk on these incredibly or ski on these incredibly long skis to stop you sinking and we're carrying gear and i must and i'm I'm pretty okay skier. I'm not brilliant, but I'll get down anything on normal skis. or cro- I've done a lot of ski mountaineering. But these skis, are, you have to, you know, they're just different. And I fell over. I must have fallen over half a dozen times the first first day. We probably did 15 kilometers, 10 miles on these things. So not huge distances. But do you do that a lot? No, I've never done it before. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're using different muscles. Oh, phew, yeah. I did an Alta, Alpine yeah. Telemark trip yeah. with some guys one time where I was the newbie, and I'm yeah. trying to keep up with them. And, and they're killing you. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's well, brutal. Well, Orf killed me, and the thing is, every time I fell over, you have to get purchased to get back, and it's yeah. like trying to get yourself out of a bowl of soup uh, because it's so soft. And my hernia was popping out, so I was trying to pop the hernia back in. I thought, I've got to go and see a surgeon <laughs> about this. And after that first day, I thought, whew, that's heavyweight. Let's but not what do that again. I, 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 it, there's nothing that's going to teach you quicker to stay on than the pain of falling over, though. <laughs> so I thought, I've really got to get a handle on this. And I said, well, what's, what's the mechanics behind this? Teach me. The, and I, because he's grown up with it, he yeah. was unable to even give me the basics. So I said, right, OK, I've got to... I, I was making the schoolboy error. I was putting all my weight on the front, and then we because yeah. we were climbing on these skis. There's no yep. there's no seal skins underneath them, so you have to dump your weight back on the ski to get to the purchase oh, and move wow. forward. Anyway, I learned because I didn't want to fall out, keep falling over. But the nuts That's and bolts awesome. of it were, we had probably five days out there. We didn't see other than moose. We saw nothing, and when it gets that cold, the grouse 
um, just bury themselves in little snow holes. We found the snow holes, and they'll get up, no they'll eat their pine needles, and get back in. But it got so cold that the snow got dusty. And for me, I, when snow gets dusty, if, yeah. you, if you've been in that environment, yeah, you sort, every breath you're kind of you like, think, hang on a minute, I'm, this is this is getting yeah. pretty cold. And we th- we yeah. we'd got a rule that if it got below minus twenty five centigrade, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. It's almost the same at, at that point. Yeah. yeah. Well, basically, <laughs> yes. I said we stop playing and we go back. But we got down to it was minus thirty six, and that's. And what had happened was we'd got out on a snow machine oh. and we cover a lot of lakes, but the lakes had frozen early season, then water had come on top, then they'd frozen again, but a light crust. So he had to keep the machine moving at great speed. It was almost like a boat because if it sunk... Oh, my goodness. It, it was just... It was an epic... It could have ended up as an epic disaster, but right. he's a very professional guy, very capable. But I think they lost three people up there that year. It's just... it. People just die. And, um, and actually, I work with a company called Tiga Cold Skills, a Swedish company. They're like SF clothing. And he said, oh, how are you enjoying our back garden? He said, you get it wrong out here and you die. And I said, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> back garden. Yeah. But <laughs> I think that has a different meaning yeah, here, doesn't I it? So. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always say we share the same language. We just don't understand each other. <laughs> I think it's quite funny. Yeah. But um, like anyway. Yeah, back garden, it basically, it's a danger zone. And no if you don't get it all right, it, you need three things to go wrong and it can get pretty serious, can't it? And we did get the machine stuck, but we managed to get it out. The winch was broken, but I managed to use a little Leatherman tool to sort of wire it up. And Anyway, we're here, but we didn't see any caper Kaylee. But I did frost damage the fingers. My eye I was much more concerned about because I've never frozen an eyeball before. And I couldn't focus for I didn't about know that was a thing. six weeks. <laughs> yeah, that I've never heard that before. Yeah. So that's crazy. well, I didn't even know. But we were having such speeds, and I didn't have proper goggles. I just had sort of glasses, right. and obviously it just got really cold. But it, it's it's fine now. It's fixed. But once you damage some, anybody that's had frostbite, once you've damaged, it takes years. Yeah, I'm dealing with some toe issues. Yeah. right now. Yeah, and, and like this last week going elk hunting, they got cold so yeah. fast. Like, it, ah, and sucks. it takes ages. Yeah. yeah. So I I damaged Man. my damaged my fingers up with the Inuit probably twenty years ago and they'd never been the same. Wow, I have a lot to look forward to then with my toes. <laughs> you do, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, so we basically out there hunting the capercaillie didn't get any capercaillie. We did end up designing a new product because he's a predator specialist, gotcha. which I think will work very well for you guys for your antelope hunting. Um, and I think it will work very well in Africa as well, but it runs on the same um, spigot system. Okay. But basically, it's, a, it's stupidly simple. So silicon body yep. with a metal spring wire inside, and now I've got a bipod that I can literally do that. Uh, or I can even, the, the wrong legs, I'm going to leave this with you guys for you and Adam to play with. Oh, thanks. But um, basically, they should have a different leg in there, but... Um, ab, this is a prototype, but anyway, you have a play with that. Yeah, oh, that's, that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, good idea. But it's stupid simple. But for for basically, he has a contract. Ulf has a contract for managing red foxes where they encroach on silver foxes with the Swedish government. So he wants something really fast that he doesn't have to just muck around. Just boof yeah. down job. So is huh. it a precision tool? No, it absolutely isn't. Is it's it a, speed a tool. killing tool? Yes, it absolutely is. And a lot of the Scottish lads that I work with are up there. They're calling them the sticks of death. <laughs> <You> know, <they laughs> said, and we didn't really have a product for Scotland, but we do. He said, this thing just is fantastic because you've got that high brush, right. a bit like your sage, but yeah. it's heather. You need to get above it. Right. But sometimes you need to get down. So it's, it's a lightweight little answer to that. Awesome. Yeah. So Mongolia, that was a great detour. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I told you no, I yeah. got a rabbit no, hole. It's okay. Yeah. I yeah. like it. That, yeah. that was pretty cool. So Mongolia, I, I mean, I'm massive fan of hunting in Asia, right? Yeah. And I've done it three times now, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Mongolia. All of them have such different flavors. Yeah. I want to try Pakistan next. Um, but base, if I'm, if I'm lucky enough that somebody's yeah. going there, I'm going to go. I'm coming. I'm coming <laughs> with you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Adam, we need to go to Pakistan. Right, but no, it's literally such a magic place. 
And it's a place I've always wanted to visit. I've flown over it plenty of times, but never been there. And it was, it it ticked all the boxes for me. I thought the the thing about these, and you'll probably get it from where you went as well, is it's the people that make it. If you yeah. get a good yeah. bunch of people and that little local community, and you watch how they do things, I find that fascinating. It 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 really is cool. Like yeah. uh, just like you said, when we went to Kyrgyzstan, pulling the trigger was the smallest part of the yeah. trip. It was the whole experience, the culture, the food. The ce- I mean, the scenery is breathtaking. That's Mountain ranges there are incredible, aren't they? When yeah. you're at when you're at twelve thousand or thirteen thousand feet, and you're looking up at mountains bigger than you're used yeah. to seeing, you're like, okay, that's that's, that's real. different. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> cool. And the and the local people have nothing. You know, they don't yeah. have all the latest kit, do they? They just got. I went hunting in Kyrgyzstan, and we. We found an I we found some ibex at the bottom. We went all the way down, and then we screwed that up, and then we saw some ibex right at the top. He, I went up with that guy. He had like rubber gum that's, boots. That's what they were wearing, like yeah. crab boat boots. Yeah, and I thought Ow. this is. Uh, he was blistered badly. Yeah, I, I ended up leaving him my boots, which were probably too big for him. But I wanted to, but they were so too big, it didn't make yeah. sense. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, but but they oh. they're very tough people. Not long lived. But very oh, tough people. My guy was uh, in those rubber boots and smoking the whole time and yeah. just walking circles around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're crazy people. But that's what makes it, isn't it? Mm. Also, eating the way they... I really, uh, I had yeah. a small challenge in Mongolia because the guide was very... protect. He was, like, trying to protect us all the time. Yep. And I said, look, we're not here to live like Europeans. No, I don't remember. want to eat yeah, a Big I, Mac. Yeah, yeah. I want to be, I mean, they were cooking us sausages. And, but I said, yeah. if we're going to shoot Ibex, we're going to eat Ibex, right? If we're going to shoot deer, yeah. we're going to eat deer. And that's yeah. really, because I'm a meat hunter. That's, that's, I like organic, good quality food. So we had a bit of a challenge in the early days to the degree when I shot my Ibex, they have a thing there where they drink the blood straight I didn't do that. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> Kyrgyzstan, missed, I think it's a Mongolian one. thing okay, because yeah. they believe it's very good for your joints. And they put a little tiny bit of vodka in the bottom, which helps <laughs> somewhat. Slightly. Yeah. But then we, if, uh, you'll see it on the film when the film's done. And by the way, the film will be out probably in a couple of months. And it's pretty it'll, cool. It'll be, I'm I've, looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's all Weatherby. It's all those brands we've been yeah. talking about. And we were very religious about that. We said, no, this is going to be a film that everybody can use. And as I say, it isn't per se hunting. It's about the life and the adventure. But I'm sure Nick will include the bit with the blood drinking. And then we get the testicles raw, which actually, the idea, I wasn't very happy about it, if I'm honest. But well, I thought, I've uh, got to give it a go. They were great. They were like little sea urchins. Hmm. I love them fried, but I've never had them raw before. It's like that oyster. Yeah. <laughs> mountain oysters. Exactly. Yeah, Rocky yeah. Mountain oysters. But these yeah. are Rocky Mountain oysters. Raw. Fresh. Raw. Tartar. Tartar, <laughs> which I've happily tartar anything unless it's a predator or, ca- you know, carries yeah, something sure. nasty. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's intense. That yeah. is super okay. intense. Okay, so l- you get to Mongolia. It's not a travel montage. I appreciate that in the film. Um, but it's still, it's not easy to get to Mongolia. All How, of the, yeah. So you've, you've done Kyrgyzstan too. Once you get to Kyrgyzstan, it's not easy to do, but then you're, 12 hours in an old Land Cruiser? Oh, so they always say uh, each country has a different flavour here. But, they, it, yes, it's going to involve people. If you don't like spending time in bumpy roads in cars, don't go don't, to Asia. Don't go. Right? Because <laughs> the flight's the easy bit, isn't it? 100%. Yeah. And we were told our trip, we, so we flew to Altai, mm-hmm. and then we were heading south across the Gobi Desert. And they said, how long? About eight hours well, eight hours came and gone. So how much further? Oh, maybe another four or five, <laughs> right? And you think, what's... And then they, Wait, and it, their concept of time's different too. T- totally. Yeah. And I, I quite like that. And I think you've got to go with it. But one yep. of our guys was losing the plot with this. And, so, well, ow. and he said, look, if I tell you the time, you'd never come. Fair <laughs> enough. We get there yeah. when we get yeah. there. Yeah. So Just, it was the right You're answer. here now. What are you yeah. going to do about it? Yeah. <laughs> and we literally, I, yeah, it would have been a 12 hour trip. And I just, I've become very acceptant that, and actually, I quite like it. When I go into any of these countries, you've got to get into their modus operandi, you've got to get into yeah. their way. Otherwise, it's just going to do your head in. And as a younger person, I probably used to get frustrated with things like that. Now I just, I can't change anything. All I can do is go with the flow. So I can either fight it or accept it. Yep. 
And the Mongolians have been very good at conquering things. So they were probably, <laughs> you're not going to fight them. Yeah. So basically, you just go with it. And I just take each moment as it is. And actually, the drive was incredible because driving across the Gobi Desert, it's a pretty impressive place. Where we actually ended up hunting was southern Mongolia. And we were 40 kilometers, 30 miles from the Chinese border. Yeah. The lot of the, I mean, we were following Ibex. So I thought, if they're not in this mountain range, they're going to be in China. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. You don't, I mean, I don't, at least, you don't think about China as being like super mountainous because you think about Shanghai and, yeah. and Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah, you think of the coast. It's kind of yeah. flat, but yeah. man, near, I mean, it's foothills of the Himalayas, like for a third of the whole country, mm -hmm. which is enormous. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a big place. And basically, we were very close to that border. But the Mongolian scenery was very different from Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan, but equally dramatic. Uh, so I saw, I got a couple pictures from Nick ahead yeah. of time. And I saw what looked like an elk in there. Yeah. So this is, they call them um, uh, morale. Moral. Moral. Stags, Marl, yeah, Stags, but I yeah. think I didn't hunt one of these because I thought, well, I can hunt stags anywhere. Right. It's not really my thing, but yeah. So we would we did this in another part of Mongolia. Okay. So Paul did this, and one of the other guys did it as well. Huge animals, but very much like your elk. Were they like bugling or? Not? Yeah, well, that's yeah. that's uh, yeah, because they, they're like a tr almost like a, a rocky that yeah. are just there. Yeah, because there's a lot of guys who that's kind of like a bucket list if you're an elk guy. Well, I'm not. I'm going to show my naivety now. You have four different elk species in the, in North America. Yeah, what we have Rocky, we have Thule, Roosevelt, we have Roosevelt's. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, maybe the, there's another subspecies mm -hmm. that's like Arizona, technically. Um, yeah, so I think there's three or four. And, and another name <laughs> would be Wapiti. Yeah. 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 yeah, or is that a native? Because they it call is. them Wapiti in New Zealand. Oh, do they? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Yep. So I would say, I mean, I've done a lot of red deer work in my time. I've done far less elk, but this was definitely more elky than red deer to me. Oh, the, yeah. the antler. They're huge it lo animals. It looks very yeah. much just like an yeah. elk antler. Yeah. It's like, and a different terrain. But you're driving all over these. The, where they take these Toyotas... Yeah. It's incredible. It's you a think, commercial for Toyota, for well, sure. I, and they should do that I because should. you think, I mean, other than one of them nearly driving our cameraman Nick off the cliff, and he really <laughs> did nearly drive Nick, uh, uh, the cameraman off the cliff, they are incredible tools. But we were getting right to the top of these. We'd never do that in Europe. We'd never use a Toyota like they're doing it. But that, so they would, they're covering, the country's so big and vast I guess the population of these, they've got to find them. So you do a lot of stalking or hunting mm -hmm. in the vi Then when you find like a little pocket of these deer, then the work begins. Right. And it was pretty cool to watch it played out. Um, but yeah, I didn't shoot one. But uh, Paul did with the Weatherby. Yeah. Right and it was, it was pretty cool. Is that Paul there? That right. is Paul. Yeah. Yeah. He's an interesting character. He's a good friend, actually. And he just lives and breathes hunting and that's just what he wants to do but uh and yeah, he lives and in the states right he's from the states yeah, he's yeah. originally from montana then went to vegas uh had a cousin down in vegas went to a party down there when he was like young and easily <laughs> influenced and thought this party. is the place <laughs> 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 then married a really lovely woman who probably got him back on a good path she's the, she's right. definitely the one that was, keeps his life in order and now they're living in Park City. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. But he, he yeah, I, I speak to him on a regular basis. And, he, and it was him and his mates that I went hunting with. Yeah. So three American guys. But they're all very successful in their own right and all passionate about hunting. So I've got a, like, a lot of people just listen to this. But uh, if you haven't gotten into our, our YouTube version of the podcast, we've got, we upgraded our studio a little bit. So we've got a screen we're looking at right now. And uh, there is a guy in a purple. I don't yeah. even know what you call that outfit, but it looks like a traditional, like when you see like old school, like Genghis Khan era of Mongolia, like it, it's... Hasn't changed. It's like a purple robe. Yeah. yeah. With a sweet, like a trench coat With almost. a sweet knife yeah. on a yellow yeah. belt, and he's on a rifle on a Spartan tripod that's pretty epic. <laughs> this, yeah, looks uh, sweet. This guy was just... 
such such a lovely human being. I mean, always smiling, always happy. He was like at, he was the one I really related to. And was he like a local guide? Yeah, local or? guide. I mean, this is going to sound crazy uh, to us, but basically he has cam. So there's only three million people that live in Mongolia, and half of them live in the main city. So it's really void of people. And when you're flying over it, you see these little yurts like pocketed out in the middle. And you think, how are these people eking out an existence? Right. And the soil um, in Mongolia is terrible. It's about like mm -hmm. three inches thick. So they've got no agriculture to speak of. So mm. it's all... And it's a huge area. So I've three million, like, so per capita. It's a massive it's country. Huge. It might yeah. be, I think it might be the seventh biggest land the country yeah. I'm, I don't quote me on that but it's it's up there right um so three million people i think they've got about 80 million domestic stock you know so goats yeah uh sheep cattle yeah yaks, they're shepherds so they that's yeah. it they they're yeah. shepherds on a mega mega scale yeah. and these people their lives have not changed in thousands of years i mean they're they get they've almost vegetarian in the summer mm -hmm. they start eating the meat in the winter they make these cheeses which are Having eaten them, I'm still not sure whether I enjoy them or not, but they're really <laughs> distinctive. I'll always give everything a go and I think, oh, right. I've never tasted anything quite like that before. And believe me, I've spent a lot of time living with indigenous people, but I quite like trying all these things. And, uh, yeah. But really, the guy in the picture, what a lovely... Bl he, just, he just wanted it to all work and nothing phased him. He just They were hugely excited. When we were getting into the hunts, you could see how excited these people got and they... It's in their DNA. And for me, I get really excited about that fact that they, they want to be there doing it. They're yeah. not doing it as a job. Of course they're doing it as a job, but... They're having fun. They're too. having a lot of fun. Yeah. And they, I think they really engage with us or we engage with them very well because we were willing to sort of cut the boundaries off and say, I want to cook the stuff and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And did, I think they did really they like speak, that. Did anyone speak English in camp or was it Russian or... They speak a lot of Russian. They speak some Chinese. No English to speak of between the main guides, but the big boss guy spoke very good English. He was actually educated in the US. Oh, and he great. was the one that if I had any challenges with, and he was a really lovely guy, but he just was over protective. And I get that, you know, it's, oh, don't drink this water, don't do this. Right. Don't do this. I said, look, I'm a big and ugly enough boy now <laughs> to look after myself. If I get sick, that's my problem. You've warned me. So um, we just engaged in all the local stuff. And that's, for me, that's what it's about. Um, and these coats that they wear, it's a cold environment. It's not necessarily a wet environment. So that kind of gear works quite well. Yeah. If it was really wet, it would be a disaster. But it got pretty cold when we were out there. It wasn't probably really as cold as it could have been. But they would come in and warm themselves up by the fire in the morning. They were, they were, they were cold. Yeah. So those yurts that they have, they, I mean, they're quilted. So basically, they're yeah, they're fabric. Yeah, they're well insulated. Oh, cool. um, and you have a. It's the same styles they have in Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. similar, and um, and then you have a box stove in the middle. You keep that burning, and you can make them pretty comfy in there. It, well, I wouldn't say compared to other things. I mean, we're talking about Ryan Lampers. He, probably this this isn't a hard hunt compared to yeah. doing something with Lampers, I'd imagine. Right. You know, it's you've got to cope with the altitude. You might have to put some miles in, but it's not something that you, if you weren't super fit, as long as you could cope with the altitude. Sure. And, and being a climber, fitness and altitude have got nothing to do with each other. I've, I've had really <laughs> unhealthy story. people cope with altitude remarkably well and other super fit people it just annihilates them and over six thousand meters you're dying anyway it's just whether it takes you 25 minutes or a few weeks yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah it's interesting how altitude it's an equalizer for sure 100 percent for sure uh so there's our 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 your rifle our rifle backcountry too how so how um walk us through like your actual ibex hunt like what that what that look like that's a very good one so and it was really interesting actually so i actually spotted my own ibex and i've done oh, that quite a bit and i get cool. i think the local guides are very good at hunting but in a different and i'd encourage people that go out there to do what i'm just about to say actually because it's happened to me three times now in all of those countries well i think they're used to hunting for meat and they're pushing animals down right they're mm -hmm. pushing them down into gullies 
and then basically doing what they have to do with AK-47s and such like historic. <laughs> they're herders, yeah, and that's what they're sure, going to do. Sure. So they don't understand necessarily the dynamics of taking one animal and hunting it in its environment. That's only my humble experience, and I could be completely wrong because I'm not an expert. I've only hunted in Asia three times. So there's people right. that will have done it far more than me. So I quickly came to the conclusion that I'm spotting these things Okay, I feel very comfortable about this. So from day one, I said, guys, I want to make this film. I want to do it right. So sorry, lads, but I might end up leaving you behind and doing this hunt. <laughs> good for and you. they took that. They were very good and they were acceptant about it, which was, was great. So I spotted some Ibex early birds, right? And they were following down. We, the, the challenge for us was then we found some wolf. And I'm not sure, I think the wolf knew the ibex were there as well ah. so there was like a bit of a party going on here and i think we i said we're gonna have to move quite quick on these you don't want to be late to this no party. so basically we were going down 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 and watching the ibex nice parcel of ibex probably about eight males all mature looking good and i'm not really a trophy hunter it's a memory on the wall for me you know and sure. at my age I haven't got anywhere to stick them anyway. I like, it, it's the meat and got <laughs> nothing wrong with trophies, guys. Love them because it, they just, it's, it's a, it's oh, a memory. You look at, cool. you, yeah. you walk past that thing, oh, that buffalo, I remember. And it brings all those memories back, which is great. So I'm not anti-trophy, but I just, for me, it's the hunt. The experience. Yeah. And yeah. then being able to eat that with a few people afterwards is absolutely cracking for me. That's just, yeah. that epitomizes yeah. it. So basically we were losing height on these ibex they were going down and we were following down as well and i got we got it's better to, to go down than up yeah 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 100 percent, 100 and but if i was going up that is the rifle i want to be taking because right. it's light as i don't know what the weight of it is but it's not heavy <laughs> right i think the scope was like probably a third of the weight right but the whole unit was very very effective yeah very easy yeah. to manage the stock design I, your peak 44 stocks i'm a big fan of what you're doing there those stocks are it's a fantastic. Stock out there yeah what uh what cartridge were you shooting that's the 6.5 rpm oh yep. yeah so that's yeah. The, that's super lightweight it's version. it's yeah. but it's it's a 6.5 on i would say on yeah. steroids because yeah. i'd say normally for ibex i'd probably want something a wee bit bigger but phew, it did it did the job right it was a one shot one dead yeah. ibex and i've been really lucky like that i've only shot three ibex they've all died on one shot I did shoot it again just to be sure, but it was unnecessary, you know. Sure. It's, um, it and he was shooting the 124 hammers, I believe. I think it was like nice. he was one of the early ones to get those. So. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's a five and a half pound gun yeah. without the scope. Yeah. So, yeah, you're starting and off two, two and a half pounds ahead of most other rifles. Yeah, yeah, which is crazy. And two pounds at 12,000 feet is a lot. It matters. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. really matters. And it's all right for people to judge us. But go to 12,000 feet and then judge us again, right? Yeah. I don't think people should form an opinion on these things until they've actually been in that environment and tried right. it. And that's a frustration for me because it's normally what I call the sofa guys sitting on the chair <laughs> saying, well, <laughs> so have you ever actually done have it? Have you done it? And then we'll have that discussion because there's no way I take a 12 or 11 pound rifle yeah. to an environment. like Absolutely no way. Yeah. For starters, you're only going to be making one shot if it's right. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you didn't do it great, up. it's yeah. two or three. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the thing if it's is. past three, you did it real wrong. And the thing is, with that stock and that, um, the actual cushion on the end. Yeah. It works great. It's, it's a fantastic. It's yeah. not like firing a big heavy caliber. So. Yeah. Yeah. Full marks. The whole setup was perfect for what we do. You know, the Swarovski optic could have been. There's a lot of very good optics. There's a lot of very good rifles. Yep. But yep. that absolutely annihilated. Did. It ticked all the boxes for me. Nice, and that will come out in the film. So, uh, uh, so you're so you're racing these wolves over to this uh, ibex party, going downhill, which is a win. Going down. Could you have shot the wolf? Uh, uh, yes, you we could. could have shot okay. the wolf, but it, the wolves don't hang around. We yeah. actually, and the other party saw two snow leopards chasing. Oh them. wow! I mean, I would I was so anxious to see one in Kyrgyzstan, yeah. and where we were apparently was like a hotbed, but yeah, they're obviously very elusive did yeah. not see any but they're not as so uncommon cool. as people think i mean there's yeah. a lot of snow it's like the tiger population is yeah. going up yeah. i've run into tiger in the wild i've run into leopard i've run into lion i've never run into a snow leopard 
run into a grizzly bear the other day. So you've definitely got more than 3,000 grizzly bears in the lower 48. <laughs> Otherwise, I've been the luckiest bloke on the planet because I keep running into them. I've been looking for some and have I've seen some in like uh, Alaska and uh, in northern Canada, but I've not seen any in the lower 48 yet. Well, I will, sh- I will show you a video after this okay. podcast of <laughs> so my daughter sitting on the back of a Tacoma, right? And this was up in Glacier, so quite close to the Canadian border. Sure. And we followed a grizzly there for an hour, and it was in the water. And I thought, that's going to come up. I thought, if I pitch this right, she's going to get that grizzly bear come across the road. And I think the difference between hero and zero as a father is like way for thin. It, <laughs> could have got, could, it wasn't, I, I wouldn't repeat the exercise. I probably wasn't the best, most responsible dad there, but she got a very close grizzly gear sighting. And Pretty then cool. coming down through the Tetons, yeah. uh, last week I watched a female grizzly for two hours. Yeah, so well, it probably is active season right now. They're yeah. they're, they're probably, probably trying to get that fat on. Yeah, aren't this they? is like the last ditched effort yeah. before yeah. they go to sleep. They're eating dessert before they hit bed. Yes, <laughs> but my daughter said after that grizzly bear encounter, I said, "What would you like to do now?" She said, "Oh, I didn't have any cubs, Dad." I said, "Well, that's probably because it's." She said, "I'd love to see a grizzly." Half an hour later, we ran into a sow with three cubs. Videoed that as well, and she was much more twitch. I mean, you wouldn't have wanted to yeah. get too close to that, right? There's anyway. a whole another rabbit hole on grizzly bears and management in Wyoming. But no, you, that's a whole, that's a whole that's another, another podcast. podcast. I think, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to predict this and keep this on the podcast. I reckon in the next five years you're going to have a real problem. I think we I, already do have a yeah, problem. Yeah. And it, I mean, this year was exceptional for people uh, with with run-ins, attacks, whatever yeah. you call it. But yeah, we had a lot of issues this year. Yeah, they're not they're scared, they're scared. and that, and the thing is, that's a big predator out there, and you yeah. think. And even yeah. even back in like Native American days, they defended themselves and hunted them with bows. Yeah. I mean, they, we didn't do nothing. Which well, is you we're yeah. doing. you look at Lewis, is, yeah. you look at Lewis and Clark. You read that they they didn't have fear of people back then, and no. the native contingent would say, if we hunted a grizzly, we need twelve people, we would probably lose one. Yeah, right. And mm-hmm. I can believe that, but I don't even live in the states, and I'm running into plenty of them. So I mean, I do go and look for those kind of things because well, yeah. I spend time out there. But <laughs> if you know, yeah. That's crazy. We had eight bear encounters in two days. I mean, pretty cool. Yeah, so that's pretty that's cool. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that's neat. All right, so you're running downhill. Running downhill, back to Mongolia. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, States, guys. Mongolia. I do this. It's this old man syndrome. <laughs> so running downhill, and basically, what I didn't want to do. Wind was right. Everything was perfect. It was just the walls. I wasn't sure what they were doing. They didn't right. know what we were doing, but we knew where the ibex were. So we carried, and the ibex were moving at a fair old rate. So I'm not sure if they knew about the walls or knew, but I don't think they knew about us. Anyway, we managed to cover some ground. We got round to the side of them, and we could see them in a shady area. So how, how far are they? Like when not you're, no, you're not far. Is, I is mean, it hundreds of yards? Thousands? Three hundred. Oh, okay. Yeah, so and we were close. close for ibex shooting. That's really that's close. That's super close. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've never shot an ibex that close before. Right. Um, the last ones have been like six, seven hundred yards, right. um, and that's why you need that data because they're you not do. an animal you can easily get. Well, you've done it. Yeah, I shot about right at four fifty, yeah. and it, that was you're not getting any closer. No, and you and where we were, we were on a ridge; they were on another like cliff. Yeah, you also weren't getting any further. It was four fifty or bust. Yeah, <laughs> the other problem is recovery because often sure. in places you can't shoot them because you think you're never going to get the animal can't, back. Can't do it. Um, so we were really lucky because there was a huge rock element between us and the ibex, uh, and I could just get up on top yep. of the crease, and I was able to. And they were just relaxed at this time, so just just yep. sort of sitting in. The, I think they felt fairly comfortable, and I shot my ibex basically on a bit of a plate, just laid, which is in the film, um, and you just laying down. And t- I think it was probably 270 yards. Oh wow, that's which super is close. nothing. Yeah, but I was nervous about that because that kind of. Maybe on a red deer in Scotland, I'd think nothing of that. But for the, they're twitchy animals. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we're meant to be the only people in that area, but I heard two full ball shots going off. So I think there was a bit of poaching going on as well. Mm. I, I can't confirm that, but I said to the guides, I said, there's other people. Hunt. And the, anim- the way the animals behave, you, you could see that there was pressure on them. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's, that's the wee fella what, there. What... what uh what subspecies of ibex is that? I, I think it's Altai okay. ibex, but I, okay. I'm i not an ibex. There's so many, yeah. I can't keep yeah. And what was yours? Mid-Asian. Mid-Asian, yeah. 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 Okay. I, if I, I, I'm just not that. Yeah. 
but I've that's the third one I've shot. But it, it's I, I would encourage fun. people to go and try it. It's going to take you out your comfort zone going to Asia. You would confirm that, no I'm matter sure. what. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's going to leave a lifetime of memories. It's and, true, and uh, it's 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 really cool. But what's cool for me is everything worked. You know, the stone glacier equipment was yep. great. The crispy boots were great. The right. Everything was stuff that I would have picked to use. Well, I did sort of pick to use it, to be <laughs> honest. I said, yeah. you, you're my first choice, and, right. and they all came to the table. So I'm really excited to see what Nick does with the film. I think that would be very cool. But I did, I did say, Super cool. no airports. Let's have the adventure. Let's have, right. what, let's have us cooking. Let's have us living in the yurt. Let's have the hunts and such like. But, yeah, I think what Weatherby have created there is the ultimate mountain hunting rifle. So for something like this, that is definitely a rifle I'd take back, and yeah, no question. Pretty awesome. Um, how how did how did it taste? Oh well, the raw ibex is raw is raw, but yeah. um, when you cook them, and they don't, they're fantastic. Yeah, I, really, really good meat on those. I I actually like the f- they did a stew with ours. Yeah, uh, the flavor was good. But even in a stew, long and slow cooked, yeah, it was tough meat. Can be, yeah. But the last time I did it, I found some old horns, yep. right? Because when I was that wasn't in Mongolia, that that was in Kyrgyzstan, and we were on horses, um, and we were out in the middle of nowhere, and I wanted to, and the guys had been out for a long time. I'd shot mine, so I came back. I basically found some horns, built a fire underneath the horns, and then did some kebabs on the top just because the horns take forever to melt yeah so we just cook them like that they were fantastic no kidding and the other thing i've done in the past with ibex is just heat stones up yeah and cook the meat on the stones and just i i mean i'm very basic when i travel i don't take a lot but i will always take salt pepper and i will take some uh truffle powder like the, the fungus. Oh, that's a pro tip right yeah, there. That's pretty yeah, that's good. Um, because it's so intense, that or seps, because those are the kind of, you know, it's a really intense flavor. And with those three things, you can do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And you need the salts as so well. So you ate like the, the tenderloins and all that Tenderloins, stuff. tried everything. I mean, I'll, I eat anything. I, yeah. I'm always, I spent enough time with the Inuit to try and eat, uh, uh, just bring it on. I, I love that kind of stuff. And I was with Joseph von Benedict when, when he shot some turkeys last. So I tartared the legs because the legs are a bit scrawny, aren't they? Yeah, they are. So I scraped yeah. all the meat off the legs, which is what we do with the capercaillie as well, and just did it on fried bread with egg, a bit of un- raw egg and onion raw. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. We were in, I like this. This is cool. We were in <laughs> Africa, and a falcon caught a guinea fowl underneath. We were in a hide. And I stupidly scared the falcon off because I said, oh, that's pretty interesting. And I was with a female hunter. Um, this was in Botswana. And she said, oh, those birds taste like crap. There's a guinea fowl. I said, no, no, no. Watch. watch Hold watch my this. beer watch this. Yeah. <laughs> so I took that back, tartared the whole thing. It was amazing. And she said, they're really tough and horrible. But, yeah. No it, often tartar, it's more, the flavors are more delicate. And you cover it with a bit of onion and egg anyway. But that, that texture is fantastic. Interesting. So in Kyrgyzstan, uh, after our hunt was, we're headed back to Bishkek, the capital, to, to head home. Um, and our, we had, there may have been five or six land cruisers, you know, with everybody coming in and out, four hunters, guides. And uh, we've got this entourage of land cruisers, old, cool, rugged terrain. And they stop at a yurt. And they, they had been collecting different things in camp the whole time they have this bag they take it in and they come out with bottles like do they just like trade for moonshine or <laughs> what's going on they they traded for horse milk yeah and mm. so we're, they're like do you want to try it and we're like yeah same attitude yeah. let's give it a go it wasn't good <laughs> <laughs> it, it tasted like cow milk but with beer yeah so it was probably just raw it was yeah it was horse. super yeah, raw but like raw cow milk's great it's still yeah. it tastes fantastic um I'd never had horse milk before. And you'll probably never have it have again. I don't think I will. No, <laughs> it wasn't great. Did you find the cheeses uh, on the side, of those little round cheese? We d- we did a lot of cheese, yeah. like a lot of cheese. Kiefer, they did yeah. Yeah. Like, like 
they have kefir with what tea. is kefir i don't know what that it's is it's like, like a, a yogurt. fermented yogurt yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah it's yeah. like a thinner yogurt that you can drink yeah. ah okay it's probably really good i mean it's super good for we you. don't consider the gut as necessarily an organ and yet it absolutely is yeah and the problem is i i struggle in america where I, and i'm into that whole food place because i my missus keeps me i'm 59 so i have to be really careful what i eat you know because i don't want to so I don't eat rubbish. Right. I don't eat any sugars. We don't have anything like that. So I like to keep it quite basic. Right. But hard to do in the states. Hard to do in the states because I'm <laughs> as weak as the next person. If somebody yeah. says all this, Ooh, chicken wings, tasty. like to, yeah. <laughs> I'm into it. Right. And, then, and I, she always worries about me. She said, "I oh, just remember, you know." Stick. So, so ultimately, I want to get myself a little four-wheel drive Mercedes van over here. Right. Because then I can cook, and I've got plenty of mates that I can come and see. And if I start to stink too much. I can always jump into Joseph's or other places and grab a shower. But it's literally, that would be a fun thing. And you've got such, you'd have different garden every day, couldn't you? Different yeah. views. The scenery over this place is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, food is, food's important, guys. Good food. You wouldn't put rubbish engine oil in your car, would you? That's a good point. And people go and have these Mackey D's and stuff like that. And they taste good. They do. But they aren't necessarily very good for us. And I think in another 10, 20 years' time, five years, your bears are going to become a big, big problem, and people are going to, we have to manage this. Ten years, people are going to say sugars are poison. Gearing was right. <laughs> oh, you're, you're a yeah. thousand percent yeah. right. My, uh, my family's a big subscriber to that, too, yeah. for sure. Don't even have it in the house. Yeah. yeah. Except for cookies. That cookies makes good are good. Cookies. Uh, what, let's talk about your products a little bit. You got some new stuff coming out? We've got 2024 is a very exciting year for us because... Um, as I always say, Spartan will never achieve its full potential all the time it's not in America. I want us to get to America. We're yeah. going to start fulfillment. I've, I've met a magic little company um, in Coeur d'Alene, um, and I'll mention them actually, uh, Salmon Engineer, Salmon Solutions. Okay. Um, I've tried to get bipods manufactured in the States. I've tried eight different machine shops. Making stuff here is very hard. Oh, very, and very they've, hard. they've looked at stuff and said, we can't get it there can't get well these guys have nailed it so in 2024 we will have five bipods in the lineup and two tripods one's a military tripod one's the mountain ascent okay but we're also bringing in a quad system now the quad system four legs four legs mm -hmm. it, in europe last 15 years they've they are not a product i would take to the mountains right i'm gonna for the mountains i need a tripod and the sure. javelin we've nailed that sure. I, I mean no, People no might question. not agree, but no. for me, I'm happy with it. I think you have nailed it. Now we're coming off, we're going subalpine, and we're going, right, what do these people need? And from a European perspective, or if you're whitetail hunting in woodland or whatever, a quad system makes a lot of sense because yep. you've got two points of contact on the rifle, but it's very fluid and it's very fast to use. Again, in Africa, it'd be great because what we've done is the, the little magnetic attachment, the spigots on the front, you've got a cradle at the back, you have four of those silicon bodies. Why yeah. wouldn't you? And it's stupid simple. So I can go from prone to standing, but I can also move. And in Europe, we have a lot of deer management. So if I have five deer in front of me, I might want five dead deer in front of me. So you want something that's very quick to and use. And they're not going to stand still after the no, first shot. Absolutely. So is it a precision tool? No, it absolutely is not a precision tool. Is it an effective killing tool? Yes, it absolutely is. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited about that. And then that little system that I'm going to leave you is basically a bipod sure. with a silicon body that you can bend and flex. And that was the development from my Arctic experience at the beginning of the year. And trust me, they work. Stupid simple. It only cost your fingertips. Yeah. Not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They'll grow back. But not, again, not expensive either. Yeah. So it's something that I think could be very popular if we explain it to people well. Sure. And, and my challenge is, I always say, I think we make good gear, gear, but we're not necessarily good at educating people on how it works. We're getting better, but we're a little company. Oh, we have we have the same. I mean, we, we've been, what, s almost 79 years still trying to tell people that speed kills? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that absolutely does. Yeah, yeah. It totally does. So, so product lines for 2024 is there'll be a heavyweight bipod. Okay. Um, for the bigger calibers you can use it on the smaller calibers sure i'm not saying i would but it's oh crikey. that's that's basically the kratos so that's again modular legs pop off 
on a spigot. I can still run the system underneath. Yep. Nice. Then we've done a bipod for chassis and AR platforms, which will work very well with you. But we painted it in a new system called the disc lock system, which I will not use on hunting rifles per se. But okay. if you're running a chassis rifle, it makes a lot of sense because I think this system is really quick for what right. we're, you for know, sure. if you understand it. Yeah. But then so that you'll, you'll have two choices as of 2024, disc lock or the Magna switch system. Okay. We're also working with Primus. So Primus are using our IP, and that's been a wonderful relationship, and they've done everything they said they would on the tin. So I'm not making any of that stuff, but sure. they're using our spigot system on top of their system. It's a great system. mount system. And it works. Yeah. Yep. So they've been good guys, and I think that will help get our brand more. It seems like we're getting there now. I mean, seven years ago, I was told in Germany we'd never sell a bipod. As of 2024, <laughs> every German rifle manufacturer out there, and there's quite a number of them, will be supplying a stock with a gunsmith adapter in. That's cool. Not all of their rifles, sure, but, but they'll all have option. a rifle. There's yeah. an option yeah. and say, there is the spot. If we can emulate that in the States, even by a tiny percentage, that's huge for Spartan. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. So Very we're getting cool. there. This little pouch you've got there, FHF, great guys. We yeah. did pouch it. We just those guys annihilated us. It's so much better. So, and I'm 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 literally. It's good when you can just say, you know what, they did it better than we did. Yeah, and I'm yeah. <laughs> I'm not greedy. If I was probably 25, 29 as opposed to fifty nine, I might have a very different attitude. But my view is, you work with great people. Yeah, and let them do what they can do. Our channel of expertise is very narrow. Sure. Right. We want a stable platform when you should kill an yeah. animal. Right. And basically, I think we've done a good job on that. But I'm not an expert on these things. And basically, Paul and Jen, bless them, they know what they're doing. Oh, so Paul's let them great. run with it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and it's the same with the Stone Glacier guys. It's the same. So I've, I'm. you're never going to get me in this life going, oh, I'm going to design a pair of boots. Because guess what? They've been doing it in Italy for hundreds <laughs> of years really well. Real and I'm well. not going to have right. that knowledge. So... I don't be greedy about things. I want to get the stuff I do as good as I can. And we can improve. But I think things with like the javelin now, it's where it needs. I pick that up and go, yeah, I'm happy with that. Yeah. Took a few years to get there. But I think it's not for everybody. But for me, that is the tool. And from you're not going to see me using another thing in a mountain environment other than that. If I was doing something in flatlands, maybe I'm going to use this system. But Sure. Yeah. I'm giving people answers, or rather we as a company are giving people, because it's not just about me. I'm not. There's some very bright people I work with out there in the SF units, in the hunting world, and some of them migrate across between the two, and others yeah. don't. But, uh, so 2024 is going to be a much broader brush sort of um, option. Where's the javelin? That thing, uh, I've used it almost exclusively for... Like I said, for five years, and uh, I'm a I'm a real big fan. Well, that's real I take fan. that as a big compliment coming from you. It's yeah. it's it it just answers a lot of questions. The fact that you've got your cant, you've got your rotation, you've got your tacky rubber boots. I was yeah. in Scotland two years ago with a friend of mine, really good friend. We'd grown up together, and he was on this mossy. Scotland's a wet, slimy place. For sure. And uh, he was on. And we're trying to get into these hinds. And he said, oh, "I'm slipping all over the place." I said, "Take the rubber boots off." <laughs> put a little oh yeah I said you should know that now so it's it's not perfect nothing is but anybody that does enough will know that is a good tool and it's a damn sight more perfect than not having support or shooting from a pack for sure um, yeah I, I love that you can just take it on and off so easy and I usually carry it on the, my belt on my yeah. pack because I, I never leave my pack it's like always right there and it's so nice that you don't have to mess with the bulk of having it permanently attached and yeah and they're so light great but job now yeah. i'm i'm very happy uh, i mean i look at the early ones now and think oh but that's 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 i'm i'm very happy with that and it's not me it's it's basically the community you listen to people and and say well yeah we should do this we should do that we're not arrogant so yeah. The users have improved that product. Yeah, you got to so, listen to your customer. Yeah, it's right? a cooperative, yeah. and I'd yeah. be silly not to. So, and that's how Spartan evolves, I think. And uh, long may that continue. Yeah. And all the time I'm in the hot seat, that's absolutely the way it'll be because I'm passionate about hunting. I'm passionate about being outdoors. I'm not passionate about being in a machine shop. 
right? There's better people to do that. So this is, you know, I just want to take that knowledge and say, this is what I need out of a product. And uh, very happy with that. But it's it's time we broaden the horizons beyond the northwest and mountain. We sell loads of these in New Zealand. We sell loads in in Scandinavia. Um, so serious mountain hunting type sure. people completely yeah. get that. But there's a lot of people that don't necessarily hunt in the mountains and we should try and provide products for them. So that's what I'm working on now. Yeah. Well, you're doing a great job, Rob. Appreciate well, it. Thank you. And you guys are too. Uh, can we talk about going uh, across Mongolia on motorcycles now? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so when are we doing that? Oh, I'm, I'm, you count me in. I really want to do that. My, my, um, I love motorbikes. I don't need big motorbikes, but I love going to places that... I love bikes. Yeah. Yeah. So so Patagonia next year, I'm doing that in March, but Mongolia 2025 maybe. I am walking across Greenland in 2025, which is going to take me five weeks to do. Wow. So if, if I survive that, we'll do the Mongolia bike trip. I'm, I'm in. I need to level up. <laughs> yeah, let's those go. Are some cool trips. Let's yeah. go. That's yeah. a cool trip that I don't want to do if I'm much older. So basically, I think yeah. if I don't bang that off in the next couple of years, it's not going to happen because it's just the knees and the hips. I'm, I'm very fortunate where I am at my age, but I can't cope with the cold like I could when I was 30, even 40, and things you do just become more fragile. Yeah. But my, um, we were hunting in Greenland a few years ago, and these Norwegian SF guys came off having walked across, and my son and Nick, the cameraman, said, we're going to do that. And I said, not without me. I'm covered <laughs> on that trip too. And most of it will be utterly boring and insane. But the first few days getting up oh, and getting yeah. off are going to be interesting. Then you've got to watch the polar bears on the east side. Um, because I've climbed in Greenland and hunted in Greenland. It's a magic place. But there is, it's a whole bunch of nothing. Yeah. Sounds pretty awesome. It does sound awesome. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it in some sort of twisted way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, it's a little twisted. Yeah, yeah like type two. Fun. Oh, that'll be yeah. That, yeah. that. Well, might turn into type three fun. Yeah, it could, uh, be. <laughs> could be. But the <laughs> motorbikes across Patagonia, uh, across Mongolia, we will be doing that. So, are you going to do like uh, Charlie and Ewan did and ride from from the UK, or are you going to? No, gonna I, I think bikes? we'd rent something. I haven't yeah. planned anything yet, but I'm. That's okay. definitely on my. That's because uh, that's always the challenge. Yeah. Is like, what are you going to ride, and what kind of rentals are available? So that. Charlie and Ewan did that. Did you ever watch Mondo Enduro? No. Oh. I'm about to. So Charlie, and you will not be able to stop it. So Charlie and Ewan got their idea of that bike trip from Mondo Enduro. And Mondo Enduro, like Charlie, no backup vehicle. They all had DR400s. You will not, I guarantee if you put Mondo Enduro, you'll end up watching it all night. It's just, it's, it's fantastic. And nobody knows about it. And it was a school teacher, a train driver, and they've got a tiny budget, and it, they do such an epic job. Okay. And they're getting like sprockets made up in Russia, and it, it, anyway, I won't spoil it, but all right, promise me, Mondo Enduro, fantastic. I, I watch promise. It. I'll yeah, watch. if you like the motorbikes, that's that's the film to watch. Sounds good. Yeah, I don't know Sounds where you'll good. get it now. It must be on YouTube or something. I'm sure it's somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I'll Google it. it. Yeah. Mondo Enduro. Yeah. Okay. Well, Mondo we- Enduro with a rifle, a fly rod. Could be I even know. better. I know. Well, I, I put in for elk units here so that I can go in on my dirt bike. Yeah. During yeah. archery season. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I like the bow. That's another thing. You see, we're not allowed to play with... We can use bows in the UK, but we can't hunt with them. Yeah. And that's such a shame. And I've, that brings about a childlike excitement in me, the bow hunting. Yeah. And I'm, I'm all right as long as I've got a target in front of me. The minute you put something living, <laughs> I just go to pieces. And I've had plenty of opportunities uh-huh. where I just haven't let that thing go. I thought, I want this dead. Whereas with rifles, I've grown up with them. But with a bike, it's a completely new little well, arena. You're, you're inside of 100 yards or 100 meters. <laughs> yeah. and it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's different. I mean, that's, that's what I love about archery hunting is the close encounters. I did a little bit in Africa. Yeah. And that was good. That worked out well, but I could do a lot more. But, yeah, I'm much more tuned to a rifle, but I would like to know more about the bows. Yeah, for sure. Well, we could take collapsible fly rods to Mongolia, <laughs> we 25. C- they've got fantastic fly fishing there. You've got amazing trout, and then you've got those yeah. taimen, yeah. which are like those, I think it's like the biggest trout yeah. family. It's a bit like those. Uh, yeah, they're huge. Very difficult to catch, apparently. And the country's so diverse because 
up in the north on the Russian border, it's very forested and mountainous. And then obviously you've got the Gobi Desert and then the mountains in the south. But yeah, not enough time on the planet, guys, to tick all these boxes. There's so many adventures. Yeah. I love it. Rob, thanks for coming on. I've loved it, boys. And uh, thank you. And well done for making such a wonderful rifle. Makes my job easy. And uh, keep up that great work. Well, you too. You make you great too. accessories yeah. for those rifles. Yeah. So it's a good partnership. We like it. Cool. Yeah. Uh, can we nominate Rob for uh, the next James Bond? Yes, right. Exactly. <laughs>